Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the Afghan issue and how is the peace settlement holding up. We have with us Ambassador Bhadra Kumar to discuss this particular issue. MK, we have been following the Afghan issues for quite some time and also with you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there is what you see right now, which went into US aircraft also uh, bombing the Taliban again? And uh, do you think this is a small glitch? It will paper over, given the fact that the Ghani government did not really abide by the terms of the agreement. Uh, or do you think that there are more such glitches which could affect the peace agreement? Actually, the most important question you're asking in the beginning. You know, it's, it's a very important question. Uh, hitherto, the uh, estimation was that uh, what is impeding a settlement is the geopolitical struggle going on in the region, India, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan, Iran, supporting different factions in Afghanistan, Russia, uh, United States, United States, China, China, India, and so on. But uh, what has emerged is this, that the real challenge, it's an important point, you know, because it'll, it'll, I'll come to your question. Uh, the really challenging part is that uh, it's difficult to get the Afghan factions together. And uh, only country which can do that is the United States, in the sense that uh, it has patronized these people, mentored some of them, uh, brought up some of them in these last 19 years. So it wields a certain amount of influence. But, um, you know, there was a, an ambassador, a special envoy on Afghanistan at the time of Ronald Reagan in uh, the 80s during the jihad, uh, Peter Thompson. So once he said that, you know, that an Afghan told him that, you know, you're trying to form a consensus among Afghans. It's like put, putting frogs on a scale. He said, you try to put, you'll find that when you bring in the fresh fellow, the other fellow jumps out. You know, this is what will go on. This is exactly what is happening now. You know, uh, this is one part of it, fact factionalism. It's a highly fragmented polity. And also Second, local, yeah. ethnic, and other divides. Uh, divides, uh, that is why I'm saying highly fragmented. Secondly, you know, there has been a gravy train running uh, in the last 19 years. It's a very corrupt country. Mm -hmm. And therefore, interest groups have formed. And uh, uh, take the president, for example. He is the single biggest obstacle today for the, uh, you mentioned about the United States aircraft airstrike against the Taliban after the signing of the Doha Pact. How did it happen? Uh, Trump had to speak to the Taliban, in fact, to, Mullah brother. yeah, and that was to convey a message to them that Americans are not in this, uh, undermining this pact. And uh, the commitment that we give, we meant it, we intend to stick by it, and please, adhere to your commitment in turn. This is the message that uh, President himself, Trump, President of the United States himself, was compelled to convey to the Taliban. He spoke for about 40 minutes. Yes, 35 minute conversation. And fairly accurate account has come out in the Taliban uh, side. So there, you know, you can see that. And along with that, back to back, there was also an interview which was given by Pompeo, where he has also said more or less the same thing. What happened is, as soon as this pact was over, uh, pact was signed in Doha on the 29th, uh, Ghani said that uh, the next step is release of the Taliban prisoners. For the Taliban, it's very important because uh, their rank and file, there's a very high expectation. You know, these guys have been languishing in prison, tortured and all that. And now uh, they want these guys to come out, you know, and they so were 5,000 5, 5, 5, fighters. So um, this, is the, this is the carrot that uh, Khalil Saad was uh, holding to uh, get them to agree to the reduction in violence and all, the kind, all that kind of thing. So you see, the, um, Ghani said that uh, I was not party to this pact and I am not bound. This is my sovereign decision. And what do I get in return if I release the prisoners? All very uh, legitimate arguments, but he just put a spoke in the wheel. Now, when that happened, Taliban said, now, 
there is a reduction in uh, violence which was agreed to in the run-up to the Doha Pact. You see, Praveer, uh, let me just step aside. There's another thing to be mentioned here is that, you know, in this kind of peace agreements, often uh, what you find in black and white in print is not really the more important thing. The important thing is, you know, the discussions which have taken place and the matrix of understanding which gives the underpinning for this pact. So uh, even though Taliban has refused to have a ceasefire till an intra-Afghan dialogue and an agreement uh, materializes on the horizon, till that time they are not uh, amenable to uh, declaring a ceasefire, my belief is, reading it, is that there is an understanding with uh, the Americans that they will reduce the violence. Which is a kind of tacit ceasefire. Yes. Tacit ceasefire. They wouldn't call it ceasefire, but it is a ceasefire so that uh, no flashpoint arises. That's why the reduction in violence yes. is a euphemism for that. Yes. So when uh, this man uh, put the spoke in the wheel saying that no, this thing, uh, no prisoners, then Taliban said in that case we can't proceed toward uh, inter-Afghan inter dialogue. You see, uh, the Taliban are actually not a very sophisticated cosmopolitan type, you know. Not the, this is not the uh, classical diplomacy that is at work here. They take these things very literally and they take these things very seriously and very intensely. So, uh, they had, so their attitude is this, that if you resile from your position, then I will also resile from my position. You know, so the, it's not a diplomatic encounter there. You, what you find is basically of a simple, straightforward positions, you know, very narrative. What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. So the Americans, they, that is what prompted Trump to uh, get in. So I don't think that uh, this was really a flashpoint in which Americans were interested. The Americans created or the Americans would have condoned, you know. But this is, Ghani triggered it, triggered a process knowingly that this will scuttle the, uh, the inter-Afghan process. Now what has happened is, immediately when they found that this undermining is, this uh, sabotage is going on there, because uh, Ghani's point is that, you know, he doesn't want the inter-Afghan dialogue to take place. If it takes place, sooner or later, uh, there will be requirement to form an interim government before they go for fresh elections and so on, then he will have to walk into the sunset. He likes his job. <laughs> you know, this is his problem. And then I mentioned interest groups. Uh, enormous amount of money comes from the Americans. Of course, there's for all factions all on the Afghan side opposed yes. to Taliban. But uh, on the plus side for the Americans, uh, Ghani has no mass base in Afghanistan. Uh, the anti-Ghani forces, that is, paradoxically, the old Northern Alliance resistance people, they are the ones now who are enthusiastic about a transition, inter-Afghan dialogue, and a Taliban reconciliation. It's also interesting, that group had some social base mm -hmm. in their part of Afghanistan. Even now, even, even now, now you mentioned about the ethnic things, yeah, you know, yeah. you see. So they have that base, mm -hmm. but Ghani really does not have a Pashtun he base. He doesn't have. So he is very much the creature of the absolutely. United States. Absolutely, yes, spot on. You know, the um, Pashtuns uh, are overwhelmingly Taliban. That's what it is because yes. also backed by Pakistan. Yes, and it was there like that in the 90s also, which was why at that time uh, they had a difficulty in coming to the Amodaria northern region. When I was in Tashkent, you know, uh, the, this struggle was going on. They came, captured Kabul, but they couldn't come to the northern regions, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, borders, you know, meeting with resistance, the real resistance there, you know, and it became very bloody, you know. The Tajiks and Uzbek, the other Uzbek. ethnicities. Hazaras. Hazaras. But Hazaras are bordering Iran. Uh, Hazaras is, you know, the, the, the highland uh, is uh, their, uh, their uh, main citadel. Mm -hmm. Then uh, on the northern slopes of that uh, highlands, leading to the Amudarya Plains, uh, Hasara settlements. They are uh, even there in Mazar-e-Sharif. This uh, commander whom I have dealt with very closely, 
Mohakik, Mohammed Mohakik, he actually is uh, from that side, the northern side of uh, Afghanistan. The uh, commander of the highland area is this man by name Khalili. You may have heard of him. He is also a very legendary commander, Mujahideen commander. So Hazaras are also in northern areas. They are uh, living side by side with the Uzbekis tribes, you know. So this is why they at least have a social base, mm. the ex-Northern Alliance, yes. as you were saying. And they are supportive of American. Today, yes. they're supporting of a peace process. Peace process. Because everybody at the end of yes. it wants yes. peace. Yes. 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 And these are all homegrown forces, yes. so to say. Yes. Yes. While Ghani is playing the spoiler yes. because he has no social base. So his only condition of survival yes. is the war going on. And you know, the, uh, the northern uh, tribes, they are also understanding that the Taliban today are not the Taliban that we knew in the 90s. Um, for example, uh, Taliban are quite willing for a broad-based government. And uh, so uh, a reconciliation with the Taliban is necessary. The northern tribes realize it, otherwise Afghanistan cannot be stabilized. The, I think that's a very valid point, but looking at the Ghani issue, there is also this issue mm -hmm. that if he's paid enough, mm -hmm. then he might go into the sunset. But he would like to take his pound of flesh before he does that. See, he's blackmailing the Americans because yeah. the Americans can't cut and uh, go, uh, go away, you know, like that. You know, that after, because whoever, whichever president uh, orders that, uh, you know, he will be politically finished in America. You know, thousands of people are dying over a trillion dollars, you know, in treasure, lives, all, you know, going way. Uh, you know. So yeah. it'll be like Vietnam, you know, the retreat from there when the embassy's rooftop, you know, that kind of thing. So it's inconceivable. So he's blackmailing the Americans. Then uh, his only source of outside support is actually India. Yes, of course. Yeah, but uh, I don't think it really is significant enough because I don't think our uh, uh, establishment will be audacious enough to cross swords with the Americans. Cross swords everybody in the region except yes. us. And but uh, the other thing I want to tell you about the India question that you've yeah, raised, sure. India doesn't have a border. So it really doesn't have an access to Afghanistan. India can act, actually, if it wants, India can act as a spoiler. And I That's think right. one of the important elements uh, in uh, Trump's visit to India was actually this, to see that India doesn't act as a spoiler. You know, he openly said twice that uh, India is uh, supportive of our efforts. This is like, you know, putting a ring of engagement around Modi. And after this, you know, uh, how can we go act as a spoiler? I'm optimistic that uh, the situation can be controlled by the Americans. The, uh, the after effects of this uh, political earthquake that the uh, U.S. Taliban pact symbolizes, uh, because no external power, whatever be the uh, discontent, uh, whatever be the anxiety, angst, uh, is going to be acting as a spoiler. Uh, because uh, basically, n nobody wants Afghanistan to take the turn of Syria, because Islamic State is also there, you know. so. Um, Pakistan doesn't want it. Pakistan is seeing victory. It is so close to the finish line and it just wants the process to be completed. Uh, Iran uh, suffers uh, from the instability in Afghanistan in terms of terrorism, CIA operations, Saudi financed terror groups operating from Afghanistan. This is a very serious drug problem, which you know is a very serious issue for a Islamic uh, country, drug problem, uh, because the route to Europe is uh, through northern Iran. Uh, so Iran also has a dif profound differences of opinion about this peace process and also has grave uh, doubts about the real American intentions. You see, this is something uh, we should discuss also. What is the future settlement? Iran has serious doubts about it. Uh, China also would be having but uh, they all, there is always, there is still nonetheless a convergence that uh, stabilization of Afghanistan is in the interest of regional security and stability. I remember in one of the conferences that I had attended, one of the Chinese security analysts, an ex-general, he had said that we do not think Afghanistan is a zero-sum game. 
it is something which is the interest of the region as a whole mm. and it has to be addressed finally by the region because if we don't come together in the interest of peace in Afghanistan, peace in Afghanistan cannot hold. Americans may be there for some time, they need to pull out. So if everybody gets together to help that process, after that the internal processes have to be showed up by all the neighbors mm -hmm. to see Pakistan becomes again a country which can then live together and build its you know, economy and other things. China's number one concern is Xinjiang. You know, this border is Xinjiang, and if the virus, you know, is injected from uh, uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan, you know, Wakhan is bordering Xinjiang. Uh, injected, then, uh, you know, it will spread all over Xinjiang, you know, Islamic State operating. And Islamic State is a very powerful wing of uh, the uh, Turkestan movement. So, you know, um, so that is the yeah, number the one. Prong from the yeah, it's a number one uh, concern. Uh, secondly, they have fairly uh, good relationship with the Taliban. Of course, Pakistan is an iron brother, and Pakistan will use its influence with the Taliban if uh, China has a problem. So uh, they are quite comfortable uh, with the idea that a transition uh, may uh, bring Taliban to power. They are not, uh, actually, whatever they may say openly, that they want a you know, secular and all that, they may say informally, but they can learn to live with it. Let me put it like that. That's the expression. They can learn to live with it. Then the Plus point they have is that uh, as we move from uh, the uh, advent of peace to the future, uh, there is the Afghan reconstruction. They can put big money on the table. And nobody else can. Nobody else can. Europeans and Americans combined together cannot match the Chinese. And Chinese are next door, so it's next also door, much easier to do. They can uh, leverage the uh, Belt and Road uh, projects. Uh, which uh, dovetail uh, easily with Afghanistan's uh, development. And uh, this uh, becomes a Chinese area, you know. So uh, they want the stabilization because they know that nobody will be able to compete with them in terms of influence in Afghanistan. So long term strategically, a peaceful Afghanistan is also in the interest of China both for economic and political reasons. I think so, I think so. And I have always argued here, for years and years I have been arguing that the natural ally for India is actually China. It's not the United States. Indian policy, we've been bandwagoning with the Americans. Now look where it has come to. Americans have struck a deal with the Taliban and uh, Pakistan because America's sectarian interests are of a different kind. You know, they, are, they, they want a, an open-ended presence uh, with a reduced footprint, with much less expenditure, financial burden, and no loss of life, but a strong presence in an area which is a strategic plateau, overlooking four nuclear powers and five if you include Iran. You know, So it's a highly strategic area uh, from where they can influence Central Asia, Xinjiang, Northern Caucasus, they can destabilize Iran. And uh, Trump has said that even if we withdraw, we will have a still more powerful intelligence station there. Well, let us face it, you know. You know, out of the, uh, out of the 12 bases, uh, they are retaining seven. And uh, w what is the meaning of it? It's listening posts. Listening posts, and they have uh, spent hundreds of millions of dollars in renovating it because, uh, you know, like a, a Russian newspaper had written uh, two, three days ago that uh, we know very well that, you know, that they can uh, within a matter of two weeks, if they want, they can beef up the presence to 100,000 troops. So you see, they are keeping the basis, everything there, what uh, Rumsfeld used to call the lily pads, you know, so they can come in at short notice, begin operations, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, the Americans uh, had their projects. Uh, this is always a geopolitical project for them, Afghan a thing. Uh, and they were talking about fighting terrorism, but this is a geopolitical project. India had no reason to have hitched its wagons to them, you know. We should have talked to like-minded countries which genuinely have concern about uh, terrorist groups, extremist Iran, groups, China, Iran, China, Russia, 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 countries like this, and we should have formed a regional opinion. Now, you see this peace uh, processes, uh, from Indian point of view, the peace process's main uh, handicap 
is this you know that this is a uh, very restricted condominium uh, United States and uh, Pakistan and to the extent of United States wanting to influence the Pakistan they are cherry picking they will go to China and uh, involve China and China has played a very big role uh, behind the scene in uh, coaxing these people to a, a moderate line you know so overall terms India really had nothing to gain by hitching its uh, wagon to the American policy. Where did we go wrong? We went wrong because uh, having dealt with this for the last... Uh, you know, it's been our, yeah. one of your yeah. beats yes. from a very from early time. Since 1977. You know, the uh, biggest, pro biggest uh, the, why it is so deeply flawed it is because we didn't evolve a policy in terms of the Afghan problem. In terms of the Afghan problem, our priority should have been the stabilization of Afghanistan. Because, uh, you know, our history shows that, you know, uh, instability always came to the subcontinent of the Gangetic Plain through, through the Hindu Kush, you know. So, uh, simply as a lesson of history, we should have done it. But here, you know, the problem is, especially the present setup here, our ruling elites today, uh, their obsession with Pakistan. So they are viewing Afghanistan through the prism of Pakistan to uh, create a second front against Pakistan. So tying up with the intelligence agencies in Kabul. And these days, you know, with very little money, you can create pockets of influence and uh, creating headaches for Pakistan. So now when the settlement comes, what will happen is that Pakistan will ensure that uh, the first priority will be exorcising the Indian influence in Kabul and push them back, close all the consulates on the Pakistani border. As uh, they have been saying that there is no reason for the Indians to have these many consulates in a country like Afghanistan. Ambassador Bhadra Kumar, we let's conclude our discussion that what we should have been focusing on was peace and love and yeah. not on war. Yeah. And instead of a zero-sum game, we should have had a larger geostrategic vision of Afghanistan and the South Asian, uh, shall we say, region. Thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, we'll continue to share our views and your views with our audience over the next unfolding of the peace process, or even if it, scupper, or if it is scuppered by the Afghan different factions. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching News Click. Do keep watching our international coverage and our news.